thank you. So I'll continue with our poor parent, um, who, as you can see, in equilibrium invests more than he should. Let's try to understand how, how to calculate that equilibrium, how to get there. Um, remember the DAG for the, the parent's DAG. He thinks that A, his action causes school performance, and that school performance then is the only cause of uh, labor market outcomes. So effectively, this is what he wants to calculate. For, for given A, any A that he's going to choose, he wants to know what's the chance of success at school, and then give, given success at school, what's the chance of success in the labor market, and what's the chance of uh, uh, failure at school, and then what's the chance of success in the labor market, given um, that you have been a failure at school. So that's what he wants to calculate. Those things are derived from the actual distribution. That contains exogenous as well as endogenous components, and we want to find those endogenous components. Uh, so for example, this thing is just given by the exogenous uh, description of the model, because what's the probability that my investment A <coughs> leads to success at school? Well, it's just A times the probability that the child has high ability. Uh, our parent doesn't know the ability of his child. So sound a bit weird, but again, we're looking at um, we're looking at a case where we have an uninformed agent. In principle, you could analyze an agent who has some signal of, the, of theta that would complicate things, but it wouldn't change them dramatically. Um, so, so this is just the probability that my child has high ability times my decision to invest A. This thing is going to be equal to 1. What's the probability of success in the labor market, given that you have success at school? Well, remember, we assume that success at school, for success at school, you must have high ability. So if you were successful at school, it must be that you have high ability. And we also said that having high ability ensures success in the labor market. That's why we have a 1 here. Because success at the high ability is both necessary for success at school and sufficient for success in the labor market, so we have a one here. So I'm just plugging terms here. <clears throat> now, the, the tricky term that we need to calculate is the probability of, um, of uh, success in the labor market conditional on failure at school. Because failure at school could result from two things, either low ability or insufficient investment. So that's the Bayesian update. The Bayesian update, if you look at the populational level data, you can see, and this is the blue thing that I emphasized here, that's, the, that's 1 minus the average investment in the population. So you, you need to, I mean, if people invest very little in their children in the population, then failure at school will mostly imply low ability. I'm sorry, will <coughs> would not tell us much about uh, their ability. But in, if parents invest a lot in their children as education, then failure at school is a strong signal <coughs> of, um, of uh, low ability. And this is what the Bayesian update is telling us here. Now, this is not the, par the parent's own action. This is what happens in the population. So his own action doesn't appear here. It's the population level actions. Let's call this gamma, this Bayesian update. Let's call it gamma. And so I just copied this. And so the, the perceived benefit of investment, just plugging the terms into the expression that I gave you in the previous slide, we just have this term. So this term involves the, uh, the actual A that the parent himself chooses. But it also involves this gamma, where this gamma is reflects, to some extent, the average behavior of parents in the population. From the parent's point of view, the marginal perceived benefit is just the derivative of this thing <coughs> with respect to A. So we're getting this. So this gamma contains endogenous features. But the parent treats this as, as, as given, as fixed. So as far as he is concerned, there is a fixed marginal benefit. So if we just draw a marginal, marginal cost margin benefit curves, his marginal benefits, perceived marginal benefit, is a flat line, whereas his marginal uh, cost is just a straight line, increasing line. So the optimal will be at the intersection. And that's how you get the, uh, the optimal A. So the optimal A will equate the marginal benefit to the marginal cost. And that would mean that there is just only one level of investment in the population. And that is this A double star that we saw before. That's the level A that equates marginal cost to marginal benefit. 
The complementarity that I talked about before, you can also see it here. Suppose that, again, as I said before, suppose that parents invest a lot in their children's education. Then, in reality, success at school is going to be a very good predictor, I'm sorry, failure at school is going to be a good predictor of failure in the labor market. Because if people invest a lot in education, nevertheless the child fails, then it means that he has low ability, and that means he's going to fail in the labor market. So if people invest a lot in their children's education, they're going to have a subjective high premium of, uh, a high subjective premium of education. They'll think that education has a huge premium. So there's a comp strategic complementarity here. The more people invest in their children's education, the bigger their equilibrium, their uh, subjective premium of education. In principle, this could lead to multiple equilibria. Here it doesn't because I assume the particular functional form for the, um, uh, for, the, for the cost function. But for different cost functions, you could have multiple equilibria. In all of them, it would be overinvestment in education. But you could have kind of self-sustained education panics where people are just, for whatever reason, they invest a lot in, in their children's education. And as a result, they experience a subjective perception that education is really important for success in life. So you can get this kind of complementarity and multiple equilibria, not in the parameterization that I gave you here, because I, partic I picked a particular cost function. But the complementarity is implicit here. Okay, so that, that's an insight, that people may have some kind of panic that education is very important, just because they have this causal misperception where they interpret correlation between school performance and earnings. They interpret that causally, even though it represents some kind of confounding. That can lead to kind of self-sustaining education panics. So let's summarize the first part. Uh, so main modeling idea, we can use DAGs to represent subjective causal models. We can use the factorization formula as a model of how people fit the causal model to empirical data. And it effectively represents a systematic distortion of beliefs from objective distributions to subjective beliefs. You can use the, when you write down a model, you have an idea, oh, wait a second, there is some kind of psychological bias, some perceptual or causal attribution bias that I want to capture. You can capture that by thinking about what the true causal model looks like and what the true process looks like and what the subjective process looks like. By the way, uh, following uh, um, um, a corridor conversation I just had with Tomas, the, the true process doesn't have to be causal. So it could be that, for example, the true data generating process is some, say, competitive equilibrium in the market. So the true process doesn't have to be causal. It could be that the true process is consistent with some big DAG, but it really is not itself causal. So you can actually, one mistake that people can make is that assume that something is causal even though it's not. You can capture that. I didn't emphasize that. I emphasize situations in which there is a true causal process and a subjective wrong uh, causal model, but it could be that the true process is actually not causal. You can still work with this, uh, with this model. But in any case, uh, certain attribution errors are easy to capture with this notion of taking a, like a baseline DAG, messing around with the, with the links, arriving at the subjective DAG. So it's, so it's a guide for modeling. Uh, that's what I was trying to, to emphasize here. Um, Personal equilibrium is a way of resolving the model, of having some, to closing the model, subjective maximization of utility with respect to the, this piece of R. Things that I didn't tell you about because of a shortage of time, I emphasized the, how you can take this language to build an application, or yeah, these are Mickey Mouse applications, but the basic idea is that take this framework and use it to construct models. But as I said at the beginning, you can use this framework also to prove results about general uh, general classes of models, and you can use basic tools from the Bayesian network literature, things that are known as the separation, perfect DAX. These are very basic things that you uh, get to see in the first uh, two chapters of any text on the Bayesian network. You can analyze questions like, is it even possible to have an equilibrium effect, like unique mixed equilibrium or multiple equilibrium in a decision model? So I just, I'm going to tell you what the true DAG and what the subjective DAG is. And sometimes I can say, well, even without knowing the parameterization, I'm going to tell you equilibrium effects are not going to be there. You can, just by looking at the true and the subjective DAGs, you can answer that question using the tool of deseparation. 
So, so using basic tools from Bayesian networks can help you answer like diagnostic questions about classes of models. You can also ask questions like, could somebody have a systematically biased or systematically wrong estimate of a certain collection of variables, given it's a subjective uh, DAG and given the true DAG? You can use, uh, um, again, the notion of perfect DAGs um, to, to give an answer um, to that kind of question. So if you're interested in those kind of meta results, you can find them in those uh, two papers. But I don't have time today to, to get too deeply into that, uh, that direction of thinking about things more from the point of view of proving general theorems about classes of models rather than applying it to a particular economic Okay, so that's the end of lecture one. So let's move to lecture two. So, so far we took the, <coughs> the, the agent subjective causal model as a primitive, as given, but as some of you suggested, sometimes we want to endogenize these models. We we'll ask at least where they're coming from. I'm going to tell two stories about where these uh, models can come from. Uh, the first story that I'm going to tell is like going to be like a polit political science-y kind of uh, story about competing political narratives. That the, the, they're, they're kind of purveyors of, of, of narratives that have, uh, that they're trying to promote certain policies and they're trying to pitch you a certain model. Uh, so there's going to be some model of the supply in some sense of uh, of competing um, causal models in, in, the, in the context of some political science story. And the other story I want to tell you is about something like a bad researcher trying to get you as a gullible audience to believe, to hold certain beliefs. So he's pitching you a causal model like the pharmaceutical story that, uh, uh, that Eric mentioned before. So these are going to be the two examples that I'm going to present <coughs> in the second lecture. So let's start with competing narratives. Uh, casual observation, um, political competition involves battles in democratic societies, it involves battles over public opinion, and part of that has an aspect of competing narratives. The term narrative is super loose, means tons of different things. You'll see the, the sense in which I intend it. And of course, there are many <coughs> senses of the word that are um, going to be completely orthogonal to what I'm doing. I'm talking about policy narratives. Narratives about the effects of policies on outcomes. Um, and the, the basic idea that I'm going to propose here is that a policy becomes more popular and more likely to be implemented uh, through the political process if it can be sustained by an effective narrative. I didn't say what an effective narrative is yet. That will come in a second. But I'm going to, following up on this approach, I'm going to model a narrative as a DAG. So a, nar a narrative is just going to be a DAG. It's going to be a causal model about how policies map into consequences. That's going to be a narrative. It's going to be a causal model of the mapping from policies to consequences. What is an effective narrative? That is, what is a narrative that appeals to people? Well, you could think of the voters, the public, as being um, <coughs> intuitive scientists. People propose different models. So they compare these models in terms of their performance against data, running misspecification tests, real rational stuff. Instead, I'm going to assume something very irrational, which is that this criterion for s the public's criterion for selecting between narratives is hedonic. It's based on anticipatory utility. The idea would be that people are drawn to stories with happy ending. So if, if I pitch you a model, and I also tell you a, narr a policy, so for example, I'm telling you a story about the mapping from trade policy to employment, and that story also comes with a policy prescription, liberalize, raise tariffs, and given this model and the belief that you hold under this model, and given this policy, you think, well, this is really going to be good for, the, for employment, then you're attracted to this narrative because it has a happy ending. Maybe under the current policy it sucks, but with the proposed policy, things will be great. So that's why it's not a happy story. It's a, it's, it's a story with a happy ending. It's like if you do what I say that you should do, then you'll have a good outcome. So it's the anticipatory utility uh, driven by the combination of the model and the action. And um, 
what I want to do then is to define an equilibrium concept that captures this kind of public opinion battle between pairs of narratives and policy prescriptions. And you'll see it's really, really simple and reduced form the way I'm going to do it. So there's going to be just one slide of primitives and one slide that gives you the solution concept. So I'm going to get very quickly to the solution concept, and then I'm just going to illustrate it with an example rather than proving general properties of this uh, concept. So imagine that there is some collection of variables, 1 through m, where m is going to be greater than 2. x1 is representing an action or policy, and xm is representing a consequence. Um, so I'm sometimes going to call x1a, and sometimes I'm going to call xm, I'm going to call it y. And the utility of uh, and it's going to be a representative agent uh, environment. It's going to be one agent representing somehow the, the public or the voters. But that's going to be our representative agent. And his payoff is just a function of A and Y. The other variables are payoff irrelevant. And again, I want you to think about how things unfold against the background of some joint distribution, some steady state distribution over all the variables. I'm calling it P alpha because the only thing that is going to be endogenous here <coughs> in terms of the distribution over these variables is this alpha, this mixture over uh, actions, over policies. So for any alpha, there's going to be some uh, joint distribution P over these variables. So alpha is going to be endogenous, but everything else is going to be exogenous. And there's going to be a set of feasible narratives. That's a primitive of the model, which is just a set of DAGs, some set of DAGs, such that in each DAG you have both variables 1 and M. Because every narrative is going to be a policy narrative. It's going to be about how policies map into outcomes. So it, you don't have to include all the other variables, but you do have to include the variable 1 and the variable m. And 1 has to be ancestral. So 1 is an ancestral known. <coughs> so in short, the set of feasible narratives, just a set of DAGs, such that each DAG includes both 1 and m, and 1 is ancestral. Those are the primitives. And this is the solution concept. We're going to say that the distribution sigma over these pairs, policies and narratives, so in, in, in an element in the, in the support of sigma is a pair. It's a narrative and an action. It's going to be an equilibrium if every pair in the support of sigma maximizes this thing. Let's try to understand what this thing is. Um, <coughs> so we're taking. <coughs> the true distribution, P, given by the, the, the alpha of sigma. What is alpha sigma? Alpha sigma is just the marginal of sigma on the actions. Because remember, sigma is a joint distribution over actions and narratives. So I'm just taking the marginal of sigma over actions. This gives me an alpha. So remember, P sub alpha is the joint distribution induced by alpha. So alpha sigma is the marginal of sigma on actions, and p alpha sigma is therefore the joint distribution over everything given by this alpha. But there is this p sub r here. So we're looking not at the, for this calculation, we're not looking at the true distribution, but we're looking at the subjective distribution that is induced by the narrative r. So the agent, the representative agent, calculates his expected utility with respect to this belief P alpha sub R. The pair AR has to maximize this thing. So the process here implicitly is that there is a bunch of political entrepreneurs and each one of them, like public opinion makers, pundits, parties, they propose, again, it's kind of competition, free for all kind of competition, where they propose a model and a policy. Each model induces a belief. This belief can be used to calculate the expected utility from the policy. The combination that gives people the highest anticipatory utility wins. In equilibrium, there could be a mixture, and there will typically be a mixture, which, mean, which would mean that there are going to be multiple um, pairs in the support. The interpretation of that equilibrium our favorite interpretation, this is based on my paper with uh, 2020 paper with Kfir, Elias, is some kind of dynamic story. 
So there's going to be a mixture, but that mixture is going to represent some kind of ergodic long run distribution. In some periods, where you should think about this, in some periods, a certain AR is going to be successful, it's going to be the most appealing to a representative voter, and then that's going to be the, the, the winning narrative policy pair. It's going to lead to a certain policy, then we move to the next period, maybe some other pair is going to be successful, and then maybe we're going to have a different policy, and then we can look at the long run distribution of these successful narrative policy pairs. And, and what changes? The data set changes slightly. Right. So that's the people learn from the past, and there will be some kind of dynamic story. Yes. The action distribution depends on the story of the model. You're looking at the distribution of actions. Alpha given sigma, sigma is the given the R that you're telling you know? Alpha sigma is just the marginal <coughs> over n. The R but the R is not part of the variable. I'm not allowing R itself to be one of the variables. In principle you could, but I don't allow it. So sigma so is a distribution. Uh, sigma is a distribution over these pairs. The agent is aware of the story of the, the political candidate. Yes. He uses that story to calculate, to form a belief. Yes. Calculates his expected utility from that belief and the policy. But if he adopts a story, he's interested only in the actions that come with that story. The requirement should be that any <coughs> it would be it would be it would receive in principle it, it yes. given but this this means more this 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 has an aspect of comparing apples with oranges so one aspect of that is for a given R if you compare multiple A's that go with R yeah. this A R would be optimal but it also compares A R with A prime R prime. So it's as if the representative voter listen to you. You say you give me model one and action one, and I say wait a second. Doesn't how, how happy does that make me? And then I ask Eric. Eric gives me another story, another action, yeah. and I ask myself how happy does that make me? And if Eric's story and action makes me happier than your story and action, I go for Eric's. So do I really think that people actually do that? No, I don't. But I think that the political process somehow is. The representative age, the representative voter's behavior is as if the representative voter makes that comparison. Yes. So, so why cannot I, as a voter, take Elkanan's policy proposal but Eric's uh, theory? And so I there will be an auto <coughs> if if there if there's something there will be an auto if it's beneficial then there will be a political entrepreneur that is going okay, to take so this combination. Okay, so for that, but somebody would jump on it. Somebody would use that. Yes, I, I think I a lot of these things will be. Here when I look at the I example, to get you both down, but yeah. the fact that you you know you compare the action and the story I tell you to the action and the story that Eric tells you is captured by that that eight hours should not see. Yes, yes. But when you look at the given hour, uh, in particular, to me you should require that only the actions that come with that hour be possible. But anyhow, uh, the technical. The the st the. St no, it's not a technical issue, it's an interpretational issue. And the story that I want you to think about is that if there's an AR that is appealing, then it will be broadcast in some kind of media, and a lot of people will be excited by that, and they will follow the candidate who offered that. It's not necessary that the same person is, is exposed to multiple ARs, but the point is that if, it's the, if there's, there's an AR that is appealing, a lot of people will be attracted to the candidate that carries that. And so, on average, in terms of which kind of candidate attracts the most fervent uh, uh, support, uh, it will be the one that maximizes anticipatory utility. It's not that really each agent is comparing apples and oranges, but it's more like how excited you can get some group of followers behind a certain platform. There's a question here. Yeah, just, uh, sorry, I didn't follow. The alpha in this context would be the politician's effect on what exactly is the alpha? Alpha is the marginal distribution. Remember, this the sigma is a distribution over these pairs. Just look at the marginal of this distribution over A. What's the what's the policy distribution? A lot of these things will be clear in the example that will come in a second. Okay? Yes. Uh, I'll talk about dynamics in a second. Okay. Um, so 
important assumption here is that the criterion for selecting action narrative pairs is motivated reasoning, some kind of motivated reasoning story, uh, anticipatory utility. Uh, this was a little bit imprecise because again, you need trembles to make this precise. Let's not worry about that. It's not, again, it's not interesting. Uh, sorry, yes. It looks strange to me that our equator of the sun is white. Our, I'm sorry? Our? White, not our action, uh, the outcome is Both. bright. In general, your utility function depends on your action and the outcome. Uh, for example, an action could be uh, whether you, <coughs> uh, Y could be employment and A could be um, some investment, for example. And so the investment could be costly and the outcome would be employment. Um, it, it's a primitive of the model. There's a distinction between the, out, the action and the outcome, and the utility can depend on both. Uh, I, mean I didn't the understand the question. Equator, the, equator the, um, the aggregator? Uh, because it, yes, because for every AR, yeah. you want to, uh, so for every AR is a maximizer of this thing. Oh. Every AR is a maximizer. So for every AR, you calculate this thing. So give me AR, I can calculate this thing, and then I compare this across all possible ARs, and I just look at the ones that are maximal. The nice thing that I really enjoy is that look how simple this is and it generates all these questions. It's good. So it means that it's interesting. But um, OK, dynamic story It came up in a couple of questions. The story that I have in mind is that every period, there will be some data set about the past realizations of all the variables. People come along, offer their ARs. And the one that is most attractive to people via this criterion gets to win, the action is implemented, and then there's a new data point, and then we move to the next period, and we go through the same process again and again. You can ask questions about convergence of this process. But an equilibrium is actually a steady state of such a dynamic process. That's how we think about this. Uh, we do talk about the dynamics <coughs> uh, more formally in, uh, in our paper. We don't have a general convergence results or, any, or, or anything. You shouldn't expect ones, but we, we do talk about this more formally in the Can paper. Can you say anything? If you do converge, or might you converge to the true data? <coughs> no, you will not converge to the true data. No. Uh, okay, so, so, let's under which you will? so let's look at an example, and, and then a lot of these things will be clear. And, and it's just an example. I'm not claiming anything general. It's just an example to show you what you could do with this framework. Uh, Foreign policy narratives. So in this six story, there will be three variables, all binary. Uh, the policy is whether to impose sanctions on a rival country. Why is the strength of the regime in this rival country? And let's suppose that from our point of view in our country, a weak regime in the other country is, um, is a good outcome. Okay, so, uh, so y equals one is a weak regime. So because for, from our perspective, weakening the regime is a good thing. And S is a variable that in principle is, is measurable because you can use polls to and, and surveys to, to measure that, is that the strength of nationalistic sentiments in this rival country. So those are the three variables. As usual today, I'm assuming total impotence. Nothing you can do will affect uh, Y. Okay, so uh, Y is equally likely to be zero or one independently of what you do. Alpha, let's just when I say alpha, let's just uh, um, identify that with the probability of imposing sanctions. So alpha is just going to be the probability of imposing sanctions. And suppose that the utility function is just y. Maybe it's related to your question before. So A itself is costless. It's a weird assumption in the context of sanctions, but just for the sake of this example, um, the only thing you care about is the you would want to weaken the regime in this uh, hostile country. So I'm giving you 30 seconds to pick your pet uh, rival country. Each one of you will have your, their own favorite story. OK, um, good. So, so, so A is the, the distribution over A is going to be endogenous, right? That's just the policy distribution that we're going to endogenize. Y is uniform, exogenously, and independently of A. So the remaining thing that we need to define is what is this S thing? 
And like in the dieter's dilemma, I'm thinking of this S as a consequence of A and Y. And it's given by this formula. It's an approximate formula because I want to make sure that I have full support because of the, all these issues with zero probabilities. It's not important. Okay. So it's approximately this thing. Um, and so you can see that there is positive correlation between A and S. So hawkish behavior is associated with stronger nationalistic sentiments in this rival country. And I want you to interpret that as a causal claim about reality, that the more we're hawkish against this other country, the more nationalistic it will become. It's an empirical question about political science. Somehow it's consistent with my intuitions about, about, about this kind of uh, public uh, opinion. Let's just take it as given that if we are hawkish against them, then they will become more nationalistic. That's an assumption number one. Assumption number two, you can see this minus sign. So you can see that uh, the strength of the regime in the other country and the strength of nationalism in the other country are positively related. But here, I don't want you to think about this as necessarily being causal in one way or another, but as being something that is driven by some common cause. There's something that makes the regime, maybe some economic shocks that both increase uh, or maybe like your country winning in some football championship, it will increase both the strength of the regime and the uh, nationalistic sentiments. Okay. So that's why this minus sign, because remember, y equals 1 is a weak regime. So that means that there's positive correlation between the strength of the regime and the strength of nationalism in this rival country. So that, these are the primitives. That's the parameterization. Essentially, y is equally likely to be 0, 1, independent of the action, and s is this approximate function of a and 1. What are the feasible narratives? Essentially, all the possible narratives that involve a must involve a and y may also involve s, but they don't have to, and a has to be ancestral. These are all the narratives, uh, essentially everything uh, that is consistent with them. For example, I want you to think about two narratives. One is our again, by now familiar narrative from the dieter's dilemma and the education example, where you think of S as a mediator so, or a lever. So you think that my actions will affect, you don't have a prior on the direction or the, or the intensity, but you do think that qualitatively your policy affects nationalism in the other country and that nationalism in the other country affects the strength of the regime. That's what you believe in. Let's call that the lever narrative. And there is a, a narrative that we have this clumsy name we call threat opportunity um, narrative, which views S as an exogenous variable. In, in this narrative, you don't influence S. S is an independent variable that you cannot influence with your actions, uh, and Y is a consequence of A and S. Both of these narratives are false, because the true narrative is that A and Y are independent, and S is a consequence. So, so both of these narratives are false narratives, and I want to focus on these. I want you to have in mind those two narratives. I like to think about the distinction between t these two narratives uh, using some action movie analogy. In most action movies, there is a bad guy who wants to, ki wants to kill you. In, mo and, and, and in all of them, essentially, there is a bad guy who wants to kill you. Now, sometimes, most of the time, this bad guy, there is no attempt by the, by the, 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 the movie to explain why does he want to kill you. It's just taken as given that there will be some kind of threat or opportunity in, in, that is faced by this uh, antagonist. There's no attempt to explain the m actions of the antagonist. It's just running around you trying to kill you. Um, in other movies, there is an attempt to explain why he wants to kill you. Typically, it's because you did something to them, and then they're, they're trying to kill you. Okay? So it's a narrative device. Whether you want to view this S as exogenous, or something that, uh, that you caused. In politics, I think that if you look around you, you will see some kind of correlation between narratives that try to explain why your antagonist is so mean to you. And sometimes they're just going to say, they're just, they're just bad. They're just mean. You don't try to explain why they're mean, or maybe sometimes they're kind. But they're not trying to claim that, um, that your actions affected their, uh, their behavior. But some people, some sides on the political map, on this political spectrum, will actually try to explain the antagonist's behavior towards you. Now, which side is more likely to use this kind of narrative and which side is more likely to use this kind of narrative? We'll see the, the model's prediction in a second. Um, but um, 
notice only that the rational expectations benchmark, which <coughs> completely ignores this S and just looks at the, at the relation between A and Y and says, let's allow for the possibility that A causes Y. And let's just look at the data and measure it. Well, th if they measure this, they will see that it's, there is zero correlation between, because A and Y are truly independent. So this model allows, you know, you, you look at the data and you say, let's see, what's the strength of the effect of A and Y? You look at the data and you see that it's zero. <coughs> and so if that's the only thing that people have in mind, if that's the only model that people have in mind, then all the actions, because they're all costless and they're all equally likely, they're all equivalent in terms of their zero effect on, on Y, uh, then any action distribution is going to be trivial in equilibrium. So in this benchmark where only this narrative is feasible, we don't have anything to say about the action distribution. And, uh, and it's just the people will use this model, will quantify it and understand that nothing they do has any effect on the outcome. <coughs> yes. It's not the same thing. <coughs> personal equilibrium will do something that is In some sense, this is preferred personal equilibrium because um, not really, because here there is in equilibrium, you'll see that there's a mixture between the, that assigns positive probability to multiple pairs. So it's not like there's one model. And it's, it's, it's of course, I would need to you to formalize exactly what you mean by preferred personal equilibrium. But as you'll see, you have multiple pairs of AR in the support. So I don't know if this is what you have in mind. OK, so, but this is what the equilibrium looks like. And there's unique equilibrium, what it looks like under the specification. So there are going to be two action narrative pairs. There's going to be the leftish or dovish policy of not imposing sanctions. And that will be coupled <coughs> with this narrative. So the leftists are going to be the ones saying uh, our actions affect nationalism. So effectively, what they're going to say is that we shouldn't impose sanctions because sanctions will increase nationalism, and that will strengthen the regime. So that's what the, the, the doves are going to say. The doves are going to say, we don't want to take impose sanctions because that will strengthen. If we impose sanctions, that will strengthen nationalism, and that in turn will strengthen uh, the regime, which we don't want. So that's why we don't want to impose sanctions. So that will be one element in the support. Another element in the support is the opportunity narrative that views us as exogenous, saying, Nationalism has nothing to do with us. It's an independent, exogenous force. Uh, we just need to cope with that. And our way of coping with that is to be hawkish. So, so, so the hawks are going to use this narrative. The doves are going to use this narrative. What you can see conspicuously missing from here is the rational narrative. That's going to be completely so related to Eric's question before. Uh, here in this example, the rational narrative is just not in the distribution. Because the criterion here is not pursuing the truth, but maximization of anticipatory utility. Each of those narratives is good at selling an illusion. That if you do this, then the regime will be weakened. Uh, the rational narrative cannot offer that illusion. Therefore, it's not in the support in this example. Let's try to understand this, uh, a, a few features of this equilibrium, starting with the alliance between the narratives and the, and the policies. Which is one of the things that you kind of want to get from a model like that is indeed to think about correlations between structures of narratives and, and, um, and uh, policies. I, I have this intuition, which again, this example is in some ways cooked to, 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 to convey, that if you, if you looked at, um, again, you could do textual analysis in principle and look at the kind of policy narratives that, uh, that the leftist would use, versus uh, a narrative that, uh, uh, that somebody who's more hawkish would use, I think that this kind of uh, correlation between the policy and the narrative, do you try to explain the opponent's behavior as a consequence of your <coughs> own action? Or do you just take it as given that this distinction, you would find it in the data? Of course, that's like a very vague speculative conjecture. But I think there is something true in this uh, example. But that's the kind of, of course, it could be completely false, but at least it suggests that you could try to ask those kind of questions. Can we see certain correlations between structures of narratives that are popular, more popular on one side of the political spectrum than another, and with the policies that they recommend? 
Um, so why do we have this correlation between um, hockey, uh, dovish policy and the the lever narrative? Well, remember this is the this is the uh, stochastic regularity that we assume. In particular, it means that A and S are positively correlated. It also means that S and Y are negatively correlated. What the lever narrative does is put it puts them uh, in sequence. So it says that A has a positive on effect on S, because this thing is positive. So it quantifies a positive causal effect of A on S. And it estimates a negative causal effect of S on, on Y. Again, this is not a is this is a mistake. There is no causal effect of S on Y. But that's the causal misinterpretation of the, the way A, S, and Y are correlated. So this negative correlation between S and Y is interpreted causally. And so the, the, the voter says to himself, given this narrative, A positively affects S, and S negatively affects Y. That means that A has an indirect negative effect on Y. And so that means that if we want to increase Y, we want to lower A. So we want to be doves in order to increase the chances that the rival regime is going to be weak. So that's why we have um, this alliance between uh, the lever narrative and the dovish policy. What about the hawkish policy? This is more subtle, less it more interesting. L again, look at this functional form. This functional form that says that S conditional on AY is just a function of the difference between A and Y. And this is causal, objectively. But in people's minds, under this narrative, the relevant causal quantity is this conditional probability. And again, it's a conditional probability. You can estimate it from the data. They view that as a causal quantity, that A and S cause Y. This negative thing means, intuitively, that if you fix S, A and Y move together in the same direction. Because if, if S is just a function of A minus Y, that if you fix S, if we increase A, we should also expect Y to go up. So A and Y will go together. This is not a causal thing, but it's perceived as a causal thing. It's perceived that increasing A for any given S, increasing A will increase Y. That's what the narrative says, that this is how it interprets the correlation. Moreover, because the narrative views S as independent, of A, it effectively says for any S, increasing A will increase Y, and also increasing A will not change the distribution over S. So it's like a dominant strategy for us to increase A, because for any S, increasing A will increase Y, increasing A will not change anything about S, so it's like a dominant strategy to increase A. So that's why the, this narrative favors a hawkish policy. <coughs> So, so this explains why we have this alliance. In this, again, everything, of course, depends on the parameterization. But this explains why you have this alliance between policies and narratives. But why two narratives? Why not just one? Why do we have both of them in the support? The reason is that, again, the context of this example, is, is that this example exhibits a certain kind of diminishing returns feature. Suppose that right now there's been some kind of historical alpha, historical distribution. Sometimes we're hawks, sometimes we're doves. Say, for example, 50-50. And we're getting 50-50 chances of a weak regime, because that's what it really is, independently of A. Now I'm coming along and say, and say if we become more hawkish, things will be better. Why will be better? Why will be higher? Trust me. Given my model of the world, if we take this policy, it will increase Y. And people believe me. They choose me, they elect me, and we start implementing this policy. So now, the gap between the historical, for a while now, for, for, for the next few periods, the gap between the historical action distribution and my favorite policy shrinks. The fantasy starts becoming a reality. So the, the fraction of periods in which we take the hawkish policy goes up. That wears off the illusion. You cannot sell the fantasy once the, the action distribution becomes closer and closer to what the action that you actually propose. That's the wind diminishing returns feature, at least in this example, that as the action
that the narrative promotes gets implemented more often, the anticipatory utility from this action narrative pair goes down, but the anticipatory utility from the rival pair goes up, because there, the gap between the historical action distribution and the proposed policy, that gap widens. So you have more scope to offer a fantasy. Yeah, sure, things are bad. Just, that's just because you're not doing what I suggest you should do. If you start doing what I suggest, then you will get a much better outcome. So there is this tug of war between these two narrative policy pairs. The more you follow one of them, the less appealing it becomes, and the more appealing the other one becomes. And that's like the dynamic process that I want you to have in mind. And this alpha is just the long run ergodic distribution. And in the long run, these things even out. And in the long run, on average, they are equally attractive. So that's like the dynamic process I want you to have in mind. And indeed, you can formalize that dynamic process. Is this dynamic process or is this diminishing returns property general? No. Uh, in some cases, it will be true. In some cases, it won't. And an open question is trying to understand when do we have this diminishing returns property uh, and when we don't. And I don't. It's an open technical question. There was a question there. Yeah, I was just wondering if so polarization could not be explained in this model. Right? It can. It can. <coughs> Here I, d I did something quite uh, degenerate in order to make, um, to make things um, um, easier to present. So I only have these kind of two actions. In the paper, we have a continuum of policies and where you have a kind of a cost of moving away from your ideal policy. And so you can get this kind of polarization effect. That's one of the predictions. Yes. So is it clear that we need the diminishing returns because we're looking at kind of instability? Because I was thinking about the autism argument uh, of the autism being like uh, minimizing the loss of the That would be a different criterion. I haven't yeah. thought about that, so I don't know how it would work. I just don't know. It's a good, it's a good question, but I didn't think about it. In this example, you, you sort of link things against the rational expectations yes. that because uh, uh, policy has no effect and so anticipatory utility can't possibly improve. Uh, but in a more general model, absolutely, uh, absolutely. For example, if, for example, moving away, for, suppose that there was some default policy somewhere in the middle, and moving away from that is costly then it is possible that at least the rational narrative will not sell you any illusions, but then <coughs> you will have to suffer the cost. So certainly we have examples where the narrative, the rational narrative does survive with some probability. I'm not claiming that this is general property. Again, this example is not meant to in any way claim that there's something general going on here. It's a Mickey Mouse example that shows you how you could apply the model. Yeah, of course, and then you will introduce a bunch of parametric restrictions, and of course the results that you're going to get will depend to a large extent on those parametric restrictions. Having a more general understanding of what this model does is something that I'll have time to talk about in the last uh, 30 minutes. So yeah, so the rational expectations and all other DAGs will actually effectively be equivalent to rational expectations, so they don't survive in this example. So you have just two false narratives that sell illusions, but they balance each other, because the more you follow one narrative, the less uh, illusory it becomes. I'm going to skip the hawkish bias. It's not. It's, you see that there's everything was symmetric in the model. There was no asymmetry. Nevertheless, you get this 0.57 uh, prediction. That's because the hawkish, the the, the two narratives, uh, they're just different in terms of how they distort probability. So that creates an endogenous asymmetry. Um, so I'm going to skip the hawkish bias. In the paper, we have uh, a simple example where um, there is a one, one true narrative and one false narrative. And that false narrative is what we call an easy fix or a populist narrative, uh, where the true narrative is that there are some structural forces that are really impossible to change with policy. Think about technological trends. So if you want to use, for example, trade policy <coughs> to affect employment, you're actually going to be, it's going to be useless because the employment is largely driven by those structural features. But the easy fix narrative takes a symptom like trade balance and regards that as something that really causes the outcome, which is employment. Um, and that's like an easy fix narrative. Is it saying that the symptom, something that really is a symptom, you're claiming that it's a, it's a cause and you can affect that cause with a policy. 
And so that is like the, the, the false narrative that offers an illusion that you could, with some costly action, affect the outcome. And indeed, in that example, we couch that story in the, in the context of debates over globalization. Uh, and indeed, we can, we can show in that example that we have a mixture between the rational narrative and the, and the easy fix narrative. So the easy fix narrative doesn't entirely crowd out the rational narrative. It kind of needs the rational narrative to sometimes be there in order to enjoy uh, anticipatory um, uh, dividends or to confer anticipatory dividends. So that's one example that we have in the paper. Another example that I per personally like in the paper is we add an, ex an observable state of nature um, that, oops, I'm sorry, that, uh, that again, that the, repre that the policymakers can get to observe and condition on before making a decision. And so narratives will naturally then could differ in terms of how they attribute outcomes to the state of nature and intervention. We have in mind, for example, debates about uh, the environment where the outcome will depend on some exogenous features, but also on your policy. And in that kind of environment, natural false narratives that can naturally emerge in this setting are what we call denialist and exaggerationist narratives, a narrative that exclusively explains everything by the exogenous features. That's what we call the denialist narrative. It denies that anything you can do could affect the outcome and the exaggerationist narrative that says that the outcome is just due to what you do, uh, your actions, it denies the, uh, the relevance of the state of nature. So those kind of uh, false narratives emerge naturally uh, in that environment. Uh, Kfir and I have a follow-up paper with uh, Simone Galperti where we move away from the representative agent uh, environment and we allow different social groups that have conflicting interests and so one of the things that fluctuate over time is not just policy, but who's in power. Once you have that kind of correlation between what <coughs> actions we implement and who's in power, you can naturally start thinking about narratives that attribute outcomes to who's in power or who's not in power independently of the policies. For example, you could have narratives like saying, uh, whenever the Democrats are in power, we have high inflation. Independently of what exactly do they do when they're in power. So those kind of narratives, we call them tribal narratives, narratives that attribute outcomes just to who's in power and who's not in power, not to what, uh, not to what they actually do. And those, again, are kind of false narratives that naturally emerge uh, in this setting. So you, you start getting a sense, when you start playing with these models, you start getting a sense of the kind of false narratives that can na naturally emerge in various environments. And that's what uh, this project is trying to do. Uh, obviously, so far, it's just a bunch of Mickey Mouse examples, so there is no claim of generality. In the new paper, there is some sense in which we're trying to offer a general treatment, but it really is just baby steps uh, right now. So that's what I have to say about competing narratives, and I want to spend the last 30 minutes. Um, so, so far, most, as you could see, the, the way I chose to, uh, what I chose to emphasize in the three hours that I have at my disposal was, okay, here's a framework. I, I wanted to show you how you could use the framework to construct examples. In all these examples, we have this kind of variable that doesn't have any effect on the outcome. Of course, that's not a necessary feature. Uh, but it's just a quirk. Um, but the point was to show you that you could use this framework to take, just like uh, people do in applied theory. You know, They have intuitions about reality, or about, in this case, about psychology, and they want to write down a model. You can do that. Um, I underplayed the, the potential of this framework to offer general results. But this is what I want to actually emphasize now. So I want to um, talk more generally about the kind of mistakes that those misspecified causal models can generate. So we saw that they generate mistakes. But here's a question. How badly can they, they distort estimated pairwise correlations? So that's a question. How badly can a misspecified dad distort pairwise correlations? You can think about that just technically as a mathematical, like worst case analysis uh, question. Like how badly could somebody who has a wrong DAG uh, get things wrong? But you could also think about this in terms of a persuasion environment. There is a sender and a receiver. And typically in sender receiver models in economics, in game theory, we think about the sender as somebody who is conveying information about the realization of the state. But the sender could also convey other things like a model, a way of thinking about data. 
suppose that we have a sender who can convey a model to the receiver, trying to get the receiver to believe that two variables are strongly associated and the interpretation could be uh, causal or diagnostic. For example, I, I may want to convince uh, my audience that a certain uh, marker is a strong signal of a certain underlying disease, or I could try to convince them that a certain drug is a good cure for, for an outcome. So I'm not going to commit to, um, to any of those interpretations. So that's the, that's the kind of environment that I want to think about. And it's going to be a gullible audience. So as long as I give them a model that sounds like it, it could make sense, they're not going to start subjecting it to too complicated misspecification tests. They're going to be relatively naive in their ability to discipline uh, models uh, against data. That's the kind of environment I want you to, to have in mind. So let's start with an example. Three variables, all Gaussians, zero mean and unit variance. I'm just making them standard so that everything is it's without loss. It's just easier so that the only thing that is relevant about the data is just the correlation matrix between those three variables. True to form in this, uh, in, uh, in this uh, lecture, the, the correct uh, correlation between one and three is zero. So they really are independent, uh, one and three. And here I want you to remember that when I gave various stories about, um, various interpretations of why, about why do people use wrong models to interpret data, one of them was differential access to data. So for example, I want you to have in mind a story in which people have data about the correlation between x1 and x2. So they learn row 1, 2 from the data. They learn row 2 and row uh, 2, 3 from the data. They just don't have the data about row 1, 3. So they, they just don't know that row 1, 3 is 0. They need to rely on a model to extract that from the observable data. So one story you can have in mind is that this correlation tells you something about um, uh, the, the relation between a drug and a biological marker. And this is the, tells you something about the relation between that marker and some long-term health. And in the short run, we just don't know, we don't have the data about how the drug affects, say, health 10 years or 20 years from now. So that's why we, we need to rely on some kind of model in order to learn something of course, we can choose to say that we don't want to learn anything because we don't trust the model. But if we trust the model, maybe that will enable us to extrapolate from this, from these two learned quantities into this thing that we don't have data about. And that model, in this example, will be our familiar uh, chain, causal chain. You write down, you, you believe in a model, or somebody sells you a model in which x1 affects x3 through x2. So x2 is the exclusive. Um, it's the only, if that's the exclusive cause of change, so X2 is the only direct cause of X3, and X1 affects X3 via X2. But because we're looking at correlations, um, the predicted correlation between X1 and X3 is just going to be the product of this correlation and that correlation, right? So this is something that we observe. This is something that we observe. We just take the product, and that product will be the estimated uh, correlation between 1 and 3. And you can see right away that even though the true correlation of 1 and 3 is 0, the estimated correlation could be non-zero because if this is non-zero and that is non-zero, then we could get a non-zero correlation. So that by now we know that already it's just like in the dieter's dilemma. Um, it's the same kind of situation where in reality those things are independent, but your model suggests that these things uh, it, it could lead to a false belief that these things are correlated. Question is, how big can this be? So now I'm asking a quantitative question. The true correlation is zero. But how large can this estimated correlation be? So our problem really is, this is our estimated correlation. The question is, how large can this be? So it's a op constrained optimization problem. How large can this be? subject to the constraint that this really is a correlation matrix. Uh, in order for this to be a correlation matrix, these have to be ones here. Uh, those are going to be zeros because we know that row 1, 3 is 0. And row 1, 2 and row 2, 3 must be such that this matrix is positive semi-definite. Because otherwise, it wouldn't be a correlation matrix. Otherwise, we would have something like 
certain studies at HBS. It's just not positive semi-definite, so it couldn't come from actual data. Uh, when you just plug the def uh, just these parametric restrictions into the definition of positive semi-definiteness, you just get this thing. So it's a very simple maximization problem. Choose row 1, 2, and row 2, 3 to maximize this product subject to this constraint. It has a very simple solution. The maximal ex predicted correlation that you could have is 1 half. That's a big deal. The true correlation is 0, and nevertheless with this model, you can get up to 1 half. You need to choose x2 appropriately, and the x2 that implements this upper bound will be the normalized average of x1 and x3. So if you've managed to find an x2 that is effectively the average of x1 and x3, and then you normalize it, then you're implementing this upper bound. Now you could imagine that this is to just a mathematical curiosity, uh, but this exercise is taken from a paper of mine with Kfir and with Yayo Weiss, a computer scientist from university um, and he was actually familiar with some data sets from some kind of machine learning study um, that used um, indicate socioeconomic indicators um, collected by the WHO so we had, we had a data set was published in, was used uh, in another paper by other authors and we used that data set um, and we tried to look at the just try to find the kind of triples that would, would get you these kind of very wrong correlations. And we found, uh, for example, something like urbanization, that's your X1, liver cancer incidence, that was X3, and coal consumption, that was X2. Okay? The true correlation between X1 and X3, between urbanization and um, cancer deaths, was very close to zero. Was somewhere between 3%, somewhere between 1% and 5%. The predicted correlation, based on this kind of chain, was 43%. So pretty close to the upper bound. That wasn't the worst offender in the data. It's just that some of these models made no sense. I mean, if I interact as a, like a bad researcher with a, with a relatively uncritical public, I can start spinning them stories about urbanization. It sounds like a mechanism. Urbanization means coal consumption. Coal consumption is the coal is carcinogenic, so somehow it can uh, translate into cancer death. So it sounds like a plausible mechanism. So in this sense, people will listen to the causal model and say, well, the mechanism sounds fine, sounds, sounds fine, and this guy looks like a scientist. So And he's actually looking at actual data. He's not fudging the data. But there's an element of hacking there. And the hacking there is the model and the variable, this kind of mediator that was chosen uh, opportunistically, that uh, coal consumption variable was chosen uh, opportunistically. But the point is that this thing is not purely mathematical. You can look at actual data sets and see the scope <coughs> for, for cheating. So that's our cheating with models interpretation, that you come with a model looking at actual data, but you also select the variables that go into your model. So you select the variables that go into your model and how to arrange them in your model, and doing that against the global public you can actually get people to hold very extreme beliefs that are completely untrue. So that's the example. I want to give you a general result. So unless there are questions about this example. So what is the general setting? Collection of random variables. Suppose that in reality they're, uh, they're Gaussian. So there's a multivariate normal distribution P over those variables. Normalize the marginals such that they're all standard normal. That's without loss of generality. And again, take a certain correlation and fix it. So the true correlation between certain variables, 1 and n, is R. Now we're going to have an agent who fits a DAG model, where this is the set of nodes. And he fits it to P. Uh, one useful observation is that if P is Gaussian, P sub R is also Gaussian. It's not obvious and it's not true generally for general classes of distribution. Remember that Picasso cubism analogy. If you take a true distribution and they have certain nice features, those features need not be preserved once you distort it with the wrong DAG. But Gaussianity is not one of those features. It, it, if P is Gaussian, then P sub R is also Gaussian. So you can use P sub R to estimate means and variances of individual variables. You can use uh, them to estimate pairwise correlations. <coughs> 
um, so for example, if you have a chain model like this, the estimated correlation between 1 and 4 will just be the product of these pairwise correlations between adjacent nodes. Okay. That's an example of the estimated pairwise correlation. The DAGs will never distort the means of Gaussian distributions. You get that for free. So when you ask the question of whether the DAGs, the DAG model will distort marginals, well, it could distort means and it could distort variances, but it won't distort the means. So the means are not going to be distorted. However, a wrong DAG can distort the variances of individual variables. And the only kind of misspecification test that I'm going to impose here is based on the idea that people have a really relatively easy time monitoring and measuring marginals. And so somebody comes along with a model and says, Given my model, for example, um, rainfall is extremely stable, and you know that rainfall <coughs> is very volatile, then you say, well, your, your model is therefore wrong. It would be easier for people to challenge the model if it gets the variance wrong. So I'm going to take that, but that's the only discipline that our audience is going to be able to, um, to subject the, uh, the bad researcher to. And here's the results. The result is about what's the largest correlation, estimated correlation that you can get from a wrong DAG, given that the true correlation between 1 and n is r. But this result has some kind of qualification, so I need to unpack them. With this almost, let's wait with that for a second. <coughs> it's kind of a genericity argument here. Um, we actually think that we don't need this almost. It's just that we don't know how to prove it without this almost. Our, entirely, our entire proof strategy requires this genericity thing, although we think it's, uh, it's not such conjecture that we don't need that almost. So let's put it aside for a second. What does it say? Give me a correlation matrix, a true correlation matrix, such that the true correlation between 1 and n is r. Now estimate the, estimate the wrong DAG, fit the wrong DAG to this distribution. You're getting a P sub R. That P sub R predicts certain correlations. But it also predicts marginals. If the DAG does not distort the marginals, because it doesn't distort the variances of the individual variables, then this is the maximum distort, uh, uh, estimated correlation that you could get. You can see that there is N and R going in here. I'll explain this formula in a moment. But the point is that this is an upper bound. And we still don't understand, just looking at that, whether this is, this is, this is really big, this is not so big. We, we don't have a quantitative sense of that yet. That will come in a couple of slides. The point is, this is an upper bound. So again, the claim is, take a wrong DAG, fit it to the, cor to the correlation matrix, where the correlation matrix satisfies this objective correlation between 1 and n. If your DAG managed to keep the individual variances intact, you didn't distort them, then that's the maximum it can do. If we didn't have that constraint, we'd be, we'd be able to, to do more than that. We don't know what the formula is without this, con without this uh, constraint. But that constraint is kind of some kind of a minimal misspecification test that we think that it's natural to assume that the public um, will impose. From personal experience in trying to get these kind of papers published, it's not just the public, it's also the referees. So if, you're, if you have a misspecified model that distort, and, and your misspecified model distorts marginals, many of us perceive that it will be very easy for people to, to spot that and, and to kill the model. Okay, so, so throughout everything that I did today, I just assumed that people are dogmatic about their models, and they fit the model to the data, and they don't test the model. This is a kind of a misspecification test. Yes, it will come in a second. Uh, um, yes, so let me first uh, tell you, oh, uh, before telling you how to achieve this bound, <laughs> let me first explain the genericity. So what does the genericity here mean? It means that if you give me a random correlation matrix, then this upper bound is relevant. But it is possible, we can't rule out the possibility that there, is, um, that there are other, that there is some uh, zero measure uh, correlation correlations um, that, that could exceed this bound. Again, we don't think that that's the case, but we can't rule it out. 
how to implement this upper bound. It turns out that this model, so you need two things to implement this bound. What's the model and what are the variables? Because remember that I, I left the entire correlation matrix unspecified except for this entry. So what can we say about the, the rest of the correlation matrix? So you need the correlation matrix and the model. The model is our friend, the chain model. It's the simplest model you can think of. And uh, that actually, uh, in this setting, that's the simplest model with n variables. Um, and that's the model that gives you the upper bound. Uh, and notice that one is ancestral here. It doesn't have to be ancestral, of course. Again, these are, with the equivalence relation, it could be the final node. But since you can have a DAG in the, in the equivalence class where one is ancestral, you could interpret that causally. So you can interpret that causally or diagnostically. I mean, if one were somewhere in the middle, then it wouldn't be possible to necessarily um, interpret that causally if there was some kind of confounding. But we don't have to worry about that because one is uh, on one side and N is on the other side. And so you can interpret that as a causal claim through some kind of chain that you claim as well. What about the correlation matrix? Turns out, again, that one is actually simple because it follows a two-factor model. So th it, the, the actual process, the actual process can be described as if there are two independent factors, S1 and S2, and all the variables are consequences of those two latent factors. And there are just different kinds of combinations, different linear combinations of those factors. So it's a very different model. So the, the true model is very different from this model. This is really cheating dramatically in terms of the, of the actual st underlying structure. Um, but it's relatively simple structure of the, of the correlation matrix because all the variables can be viewed as combinations of independent Gaussians. So that's how you implement the upper bound. Now, what about the, the formula? Turns out that it's pretty bad. You can cheat by a lot. The, not only does the formula increase with n, but it actually converges to 1 when n goes to infinity. And actually, there's a stronger result. Give me any correlation that you want to implement between minus 1 and 1. With, if, you, if you allow n to be sufficiently large, you can get approximate uh, uh, as, as close as you want to that, to that correlation. So no matter what the true correlation is, you can get any correlation that you want with a sufficiently long chain, again, depending provided that you can also choose the intermediate variables. Uh, th the way we were able to do that in our data fishing expedition with the WHO, we just looked for those kind of intermediate variables. And then ex post, you can, tell, uh, you can provide some kind of uh, half-baked mechanism that would make it sound like it's plausible. Um, this goes up pretty fast. I mean, with, with only two variables, you can't cheat. And this is for r equals 0. You can't cheat with two variables. With three variables, we saw in the example that you can get to 50%. With five variables, you can get over 70%. So from 0 to 0 0.7 with five variables, that's quite fast. And the Gaussianity here plays a big role. For example, we did some kind of exercise just with chains and binary uniform variables. And the upper bound is much, much lower. So the Gaussianity here plays a big role. In other words, linear models are really bad in terms of the ability to cheat with linear models. So if you have a misspecified collection of uh, regression equations, uh, uh, the, the dangers are, are, are okay. pretty harsh. Can you say harsh. why uh, intuitively Gaussian is so dangerous? Uh, when I tell you a few words about the proof, I'll, that, that will be the good place to show that. Um, so the, the cheating with models interpretation of that would be, again, doesn't, you don't have to take that interpretation. It could just be, it could be viewed as some kind of worst case analysis uh, of this kind of model. Um, but the model hacking interpretation is that there's some researcher, he's trying to convince you that certain two variables are strongly associated, and he has freedom to mess around with the variables that he's going to put into the model, and then how to arrange them. It's actually worse than that. You can actually choose the variables and let, and then delegate the model discovery to an algorithm. For example, and that's a result, if you chose the variables in the model and then you let the Chao Lu algorithm to discover a tree, it will discover the chain that implements the upper bound. So you could actually claim, I'm not hacking with the model, but I am dis dis 
deciding which variables are going to enter the model and let the algorithm decide uh, what's the best model to, uh, to, to um, somehow arrange or explain the data. Uh, so that would be the model hacking interpretation. Again, we don't think of this interaction as being an interaction between a scientist and a group of, uh, say, uh, uh, an audience in an applied micro seminar. No, that's not the environment I have in mind. We have in mind that for this interpretation, um, uh, a, researcher, a researcher who interacts with, uh, with the general public uh, we're going to be less sophisticated in the kind of misspecification tests and the ability to spot hacking. Um, that's kind of the, that, that's the cheating with models interpretation uh, that we have in mind. And of course, n is a, is a parameter here. We view that as some kind of limit on the model complexity. Uh, I think it would be completely insane to walk you through the detailed proof when we're at the end of this journey. But I do want to just tell you what the outline of the proof is. Um, so it, the proof has three steps. In the first two steps, we basically start from the universe of, of DAGs, of all DAGs, to the chain. So in the first step, and this is where the genericity aspect uh, kicks in, it's a result that we prove. And it's related to kind of folk results in this community. Um, I say folk because everybody knows it, but it's actually hard to find results like this, so you have to prove this yourself. If you want to preserve marginals of individual variables for generic Gaussian distributions, then your DAG must be perfect. What is a perfect DAG? It's a DAG that doesn't have any immoralities, where all the parents are married. If you have a DAG with unmarried parents, then there will be Gaussians. With most Gaussi for most Gaussians, it will distort at least one variable. Okay, so this is where the genericity comes from. It basically enables us to shrink the, the universe of DAGs to perfect DAGs, DAGs that don't have any immoralities. That's the first step. And this is where the, the misspecification test don't distort the marginals and the, um, and, the, uh, and the genericity, this is where they kick in. The second step takes us from perfect DAGs to chains. The second step says, give me a Gaussian and give me a perfect DAG, I can find another Gaussian and a chain model with weakly fewer variables that are going to give us the same correlation that we're trying to sustain. We're trying to sustain some correlation. I can do it with a certain DAG and a certain Gaussian. Then I can do it, if I can do it that way, I can also do it with a different Gaussian and a, diff and a chain model. So the reduction from perfect DAGs to chain models uh, is without loss of generality. And this is where we use the uh, tool, again, basic tool in the Bayesian network literature called junction trees. Don't have time to, to go walk you through that, but it's kind of makes a nice impression to say junction trees. So I, I wanted to say junction trees. So I said it now three times. Um, OK, so I, I won't have time to go into that. Happy to elaborate uh, offline. Then once we know that we're looking at chains, then the problem that, remember that for chains, the predicted correlation is just the product of certain, of certain correlations. If, you, if you one causes two, causes three, causes four, then the predicted correlation is just the product of the adjacent correlations. So it, it ends product? up being, why is it the product? Why is it the product? Mm -hmm. You just think of it as, as like a sequence of uh, regre simple regressions, regress x2 on x1, x3 on x2 and so forth. And so because all the variables are standard normals, then the correlation is just the betas, the regression coefficients. And so if you plug the estimates, if of each, you estimate each of those regression equations and you want to know how do you get, what's the effect of x1 and xn, it's just going to be the product of the regression coefficients. Okay? And so, so it, it, you end up having what's called a semi-definite programming problem. You, your object is choosing um, semi-definite, semi-positive definite matrix. Okay, you're trying to maximize a certain functional, uh, and you also have the restriction that uh, the diagonals are ones, and that uh, the objective correlation between one and n is r. So it's, you have a bunch of constraints. Now the solution of that, y you can you can solve that algebraically, or you can solve that. Uh, with a geometric analogy, and the geometric analogy is like representing 
the variable 1 and variable n as two points on a sphere, and those other variables can be thought of locating intermediate points, and, you're, and the problem of minimizing, uh, maximizing the correlations, the estimated correlation, is like minimizing the path as you travel through those midpoints. And for, for because of this Gaussianity uh, um, restriction, it's a sphere. With binary variables, the geometry wouldn't be a sphere, it would be walking on some kind of grid, and so you're more restricted in the, in the shortest path. So it's, that's like the intuition. It's like you're more restricted than the shortest path that you can get. That's, like, that's the geometric intuition that I would, that I would give. So that's the structure of the proof. Those two steps use DAG tools. That one is using tools that are outside the DAG uh, environment. And frankly, I, that, that's Yair's Weiss's uh, contribution to a large extent. Uh, no time, and no patience to, to do this more thoroughly. But this was just an elaboration of this proof. So let's summarize. So what did we try to do in the second part? In this part, rather than taking the DAG as given, we endogenized the DAG and we told two stories. In one story, a DAG was a building block in a model of competing narratives, where the behavioral assumption was that the representative voter chooses narratives hedonically in terms of the anticipatory utility uh, that the narrative policy pair uh, confers. Um, the second part of the talk was kind of more technical and tried to at least give you a sense that you could use tools from, uh, from the Bayesian network literature uh, to analyze more systematically the kind of belief errors that you could get from misspecified causal models. Can they distort marginals? Can they, maybe they cannot distort marginals. To what extent can they distort correlations? You can use tools like perfect DAGs or junction trees to, to get you through those kind of questions. So it's just, again, trying to make the point, even though I didn't have time to fully argue that, that the Bayesian network formalism is not just a language that helps you construct models, but also helps you analyzing claims about general classes of models. The grand summary, the DAG approach. It's a rich class of misspecified model. Don't have to interpret them causally, but they have a natural interpretation as causal models, and a lot of the psychological intuitions that go into writing such a model are based on some notion of causal misperception. So it's a guide for building economic models where agents have misspecified subjective models. There are lots of applications that you can have in mind. I'll mention a few later on. You can rely on available techniques from this uh, literature to answer more general questions about classes of models. More stuff that I didn't have time to talk about. In terms of application, one of my favorite applications, and but also frustrating application because I wasn't able to go as far as I wanted to, was to apply that to monetary policy where the, the idea is that you have a central bank and the, and the private sector, and the private sector doesn't get the Phillips curve right. It inverts the causality. There's a true Phillips curve, and there's a misspecified Phillips curve that inverts the <clears throat> the relation between inflation and uh, unemployment, for example. So I have a Mickey Mouse example of that in a couple of papers. Um, another example that I have in the review article is a Roy model, where you have people, for example, choosing whether to switch from one profession to another, whether to migrate from one country to another. And the true process is a Roy model, where there's some kind of selection going on, that I get a signal that affects my that affects my earnings in the current country, but it would also affect my earning, would be relevant to my earnings in another country. The standard Roy model assumes that the agents know everything, or at the very least have rational expectations, but it's very natural to assume that agents don't fully understand the role of selection, and they don't understand the causal effect of migrating on their um, earnings. So I have a Mickey Mouse Roy model, and I think it's a fruitful uh, direction for research. Uh, Heine Schumacher and Heidi Tyson have a nice paper um, that takes this um, uh, formalism to a contract theory setting. We have a principal and an agent, and the agent he has a misperceived model uh, of the mapping from actions to consequences. He doesn't understand the, the production process. Um, the question that came up indirectly is whether you 
could reveal somebody's subjective causal model from choice data. So this uh, exercise by Andrew Ellis and Heidi um, is about eliciting from stochastic choice data uh, subjective causal uh, models. Many of the questions today were about people, about the question of, wait a second, these DAGs, they really are just not inherently causal. The, the, the directionality is not fully meaningful. These were fundamentally questions about the distinction between causal misperception and causal inference. You can, in principle, ask questions. It's not, I focused on causal misperception, but I didn't ask questions about causal inference. Um, the new paper is kind of trying to focus on the question of how people draw inferences, uh, uh, causal inferences from observational data, rather than thinking about how they misperceive causal relations. And there's some new uh, experimental and feed empirical work about trying to, again, tease out uh, people's subjective narratives and causal models from either experimental data or field data. This is just very preliminary, and I'm not an expert, but I'm just mentioning this because I think it's potentially interesting. Um, one last thing. Whenever you have those kind of mo uh, concepts of equilibrium with non-rational expectations, there are actually in the literature two traditions. One is the misspecified models tradition, which says people arrive with a prior model. They confront dogmatic, they're quite dogmatic about that, and they confront the model with the data, and they form beliefs. This is the tradition that I follow. There's a different of the tradition that actually, for example, GEL is an algebraic expectations equilibrium, or S1 equilibrium or more in that tradition. People don't arrive with a the model. They just look at data, and they extract beliefs from the data following some kind of parsimony criterion. Those two approaches are not mutually contradictory. You could sometimes move from one approach to another, and in a parallel line of work, I've been taking that dual approach of thinking about people as looking at data without a model and extracting a belief following some kind of simplicity uh, uh, heuristic. And sometimes there is an equivalence between the Bayesian network representation and that kind of procedure. Uh, and, and for some applications, you feel like the more natural way of writing down the model follows the second tradition rather than the first. So you can go back and forth between uh, these things. And in general, this approach that I showed you today is uh, closely related to other approaches. I didn't have time to talk about that. Those other approaches like cursed equilibrium and knowledge-based expectations, Burke Nash, I only hinted at that. If you're interested, you'll find a detailed discussion in the review article. And that's all I wanted to say. First, you, you, of course, you need to be able to, uh, to use variables about which you have the relevant data. And you need to somehow prevent the audience from checking the other entries in the correlation matrix. Either you manage to make sure that they don't have that data, or maybe they're not sophisticated enough to know what to do with that data. It wasn't worst case analysis because there was still, it wasn't entirely worst case because there was still this uh, model misspecification constraint that you can't distort the marginals. Things no, could be even no. worse if you allow them to distort the marginals. The problem with that is that if you allow them to distort the marginals, they will want to take that distortion to infinity. So that's why it, it would be a bit weird mm -hmm. 
for us to completely relax that constraint because then the optimum, we don't have full characterization of the optimum, but we have examples, and the examples, uh, the, the predicted marginals, the variance goes to infinity. So it just doesn't make sense that you'll be able to cheat to such an extent. Um, so I thought you were assuming that. Yeah, I assume that. I assume that. If I relax that, then it's not like the optimum would be interior in this, in this sense. It would go to infinity. Uh, that would be so that's one of the reasons that we impose that margin. Thank you for bearing with this <laughs> and, and to lunch. Thank you.